Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to give it a couple more minutes for registrants to join, and we will begin in a couple of minutes. Thanks. Welcome to NVMe 1.4, Features and Compliance, Everything You Need to Know. This is sponsored by NVM Express, Inc. And today we will be joined by Nick Adams, Platform Storage Architect at Intel, and David Wolf, Senior Engineer of Data Center Technologies at the UNH IOL. I'm going to pass it along to Nick here. Hey, so this is Nick Adams. I am, like I like, uh, was introduced earlier, a platform architect at Intel. We're going to walk through uh, the agenda to start, and then we'll get going from there. Uh, so the, the first thing that we have on the agenda today, we're going to talk about some of the changes to the N, uh, NVMe base specification revision 1.4. Uh, we'll walk through uh, some of the new features and give an overview of the ones that we're uh, not going to be talking to as well today. We'll also be talking to the scope for some of the, the mandatory changes that are going into the specification and why uh, people that are doing implementation should care about those mandatory changes and, and some of the reasons why you should move to the 1.4 version of the spec. Uh, we'll also be spending time talking about uh, the compliance program and the associated tools. We'll go through an overview uh, for some of the, the features specifically uh, that were added for 1.4 and, and kind of give an overview of the, the program as a whole. So with that, uh, we're going to get started. So the first question here is, you know, where, where do you start? Uh, as someone who wants to be able to implement uh, NVMe base spec 1.4, uh, what do you do? We, we'd recommend that you go out to the NVM Express website, and under the, the specification section, you'll see uh, a link to a list of changes that went into the 1.4 specification. Uh, that, that'll lead to a web page that gives a, a kind of a detailed uh, description of all the various new features, the features that previously existed but were extended, as well as a list of, of mandatory changes for uh, kind of compliance to the 1.4 uh, specification of the document, or excuse me, uh, updated specification. So the, the goal here is just that there would be a place where uh, an implementer uh, or someone who's going to be needing to use that, that new revision of the spec can look and get a, a very detailed list of all uh, in that large spec to go to to actually uh, get the details about those changes. So that, that's definitely where we would have you uh, look at the beginning. Uh, it's a good first place to go. So we want to encourage folks to go there. But with that, today we're going to talk about uh, what has gone into the NVMe 1.4 specification 
and, and some of the enhancements. And then we'll also uh, just kind of overview a few of those things so that you can get some more information about some of the specifics. As uh, soon as you look here on, on the next slide, we have a list of uh, just new features that went into the spec. Um, we're going to go over today uh, IO determinism, some of the features do for you. We'll talk about IO performance and endurance. Uh, we'll talk to the persistent event log, namespace write protect, the verify command, and rebuild assist. But in addition to those changes, uh, there's a number of other things that went into the specification that we, we would encourage you to, to read about inside the spec itself. Uh, that list is here on the right. Um, but some of the major ones there, uh, the persistent memory region, asymmetric namespace access, and, and, and NVM sets, although we'll, we'll touch on sets today as well. Okay. Moving from there. So the first piece that we wanted to talk to is IO determinism. And, and, and kind of the, the infrastructure that's needed for IO determinism is NVM sets. Uh, what NVM sets are is a, is a mechanism to be able to take an SSD and split it into multiple different quality of service isolated regions. Um, and, and what's going on here is effectively, you know, as you create namespaces inside of an NVM set, actions, you know, the quality of service, the response time, the latency that happens inside of one set will not impact the quality of service that's happening inside of another set. So this is a key aspect of this set construct. So as you uh, create multiple sets, even inside of a single device, that quality of service is separated. Now that doesn't apply to namespaces that are inside of the same set. Those will have impacts on each other. However, namespaces that are created in different sets uh, will have that quality of service kind of isolation. And, and so that's a key uh, construct that is uh, added to NVMe 1.4. As we move forward from there, uh, one of the other key pieces of IO determinism is this thing called the predictable latency mode. And so what this does is it allows you to take advantage of that, that service uh, kind of isolation that the NVM sets provide you. And it basically creates two types of windows. There's one window of time that's called the deterministic window and another period of time called the non-deterministic window. And so within a set, you can have these, these two types of windows and effectively inside of the deterministic window, your latencies will be guaranteed. So you know that a read will, take a, it will respond in a certain amount of time. Uh, inside of the non-deterministic window, what happens is that the drive is able to do background tasks. You're able to take care, uh, the, the drive itself is able to take care of those things that will impact uh, our, our read latencies uh, in a known period of time. And so as long as a host is interfacing with the drive during the deterministic window, it will get an, a known response. Now, the, the way to really get a benefit out of this and, and make sure that you're always able to get a known response is to actually set up two NVM sets. And these two sets can either be on separate uh, SSDs or they can be inside of the same SSD. Um, because again, even inside the same SSD, two sets will have that, that isolation of the QoS response. And so um, with this, basically, if you have the same data in two NVM sets, you can make sure if you offset them, if you kind of have like a phased offset between the uh, when those deterministic and non-deterministic windows are uh, kind of aligned in time, then you're able to always be able to be inside of a deterministic window uh, for the same set of data. And so what this allows for, you know, if you set up your host appropriately, is being able to always be inside of a deterministic window for a certain set of data. And, and this can be a big advantage uh, to a host that wants to ensure uh, that, that high quality, fast response time on reads. So this is the first uh, functionality or feature that uh, we wanted to talk to today. 
The next feature that we wanted to go over was IO performance and endurance sense. And what this is, is this is a mechanism uh, for hosts to kind of optimize the way that they use an NVMe device. And it allows the device to be able to tell the host, hey, if you want to be able to get the best quality uh, and performance, uh, this is kind of how you have to interact with this particular device. Uh, and, and what it really comes down to is communicating from the device up to the host uh, alignment and granularity for trans IO transactions. So inside of a particular namespace, uh, the, effectively, if the IO transactions are aligned to a particular size and they are of at least a minimum size of, of granularity, that you will end up with kind of an optimal interface for how the media on that particular device works. And so as you look at the diagram here, effectively how this works is that as long as you stay on the alignment that's communicated by the drive and the size of those transactions meets that minimum granularity, you'll end up with a, a uh, kind of optimized interface to the, uh, to the device. So for, on this particular example, it's important that the device is able to communicate those uh, those alignment requirements and, the, and the, the sizing requirements up to the host, but then also that the host uh, lives within those boundaries. Now, you know, one of the things here is that this is an optional feature. And if you don't, from a host perspective, uh, kind of work on these boundaries, uh, or I shouldn't say work on those boundaries, but if, if you don't align with those, those boundaries, uh, the functionality will still work it just won't be optimal. There will be additional background tasks that the drive has to do and, and the latencies will not be as uh, short as they could be. The performance may not be as, as high as it could be. However, the functionality will still work. Uh, but in order to optimize that, uh, the host must uh, conform to these uh, recommendations. Uh, the next feature that we wanted to talk about today is namespace write protect. This is a feature that was added that allows a host to actually set up a couple of different modes of write protection for a particular namespace. Uh, the two forms of write protection that are supported by this feature is a write protect until power cycle and a permanent write protect. Now, what this does is, is kind of like what it, it sounds like, right? You, you, from the host, you're able to take a particular namespace and set it up such that until the drive is power cycled, that it will actually, you know, only be, you know, be in this write protected mode. Or you can actually permanently write protect the drive and there's no mechanism uh, defined by the specification to be able to get out of that mode. And as you look here on the right side of this, uh, this slide, there are a number of functions that are still able to be working in this, uh, you know, while you're in this write protected mode, but none of them allow for modification of the device itself. Uh, some of these features potentially could uh, cause uh, changes to the drive, but those, any command that's sent uh, that will require a change to the drive will come back with an error. So something like a security send might result in a change to the drive, um, but in the case where this write protect is turned on, if that was to, going, to be a, going to happen, then the drive would respond with an error condition uh, as expected. So things like compare or read or, or reservations, um, those functionalities will still work, uh, verify. Uh, however, things like write or write zeros or some of those types of commands, uh, th they will uh, fail when you are in this write protected mode. Moving on to the next feature, uh, rebuild assist. So rebuild assist is a functionality where the ho excuse me, where the drive is actually helping the host to be able to uh, ensure that all the content that was on the drive uh, is able to be, uh, let's say here, uh, kind of understood before there are actually unrecoverable errors. So uh, what's going on here is typically this is a, 
intended for a scenario where the host actually has multiple devices. Uh, and it, when I say multiple devices, I mean multiple SSDs, multiple storage devices. And in this case, what is happening is the drive is actually tracking two different types of error conditions on the drive itself. One, where a particular block is sitting on a, on a piece of media that's no longer able to be read, and it's keeping track of effectively all the blocks that are not able to be uh, read because the underlying media has some sort of issue. It's also keeping track of uh, LBA ranges that are associated with some sort of component failure, whether that be a die or a channel or some kind of other piece inside. And so there's a range of LBAs that are no longer good. And the idea is that once the device becomes aware of the fact that there is some sort of uh, either bad media or, or component failure, that it's able to notify the host. The host is then able to read a listing of what LBAs ranges had issues and what specific LBAs within those ranges had issues and get a list of effectively bad blocks or bad LBAs back up to the up to it you know up to the host once that list is uh, you know retrieved the the intent here is that the host goes to another NVMe device again with the same information on it and is able to read those blocks from the second NVMe device and then write them back to the, the you know, NVMe device that has bad LBAs into that same location so that the, that same LBA, so that the actual device that had those bad blocks is able to move them to a different piece of media so that they would be able to be uh, you know, read going forward. Now, again, this isn't an ideal scenario, but what's going on is effectively making sure that the host does not lose data. It's an early indication that the drive is having issues. And the, the more of these things that go bad, uh, the, the quicker uh, someone would need to actually re, uh, replace that device. However, the intent here is, you know, while that problem is minimal, that you're able to be aware and restore that data off of a, a, another good device. So that's the goal here. Moving forward, we've got the verify command. So with the verify command, um, there, this is basically a, a new command that's there to check the integrity of uh, stored data. And the key piece here is that you're performing things like uh, protection information checks on the drive without transferring all of the data associated with that uh, that read uh, across uh, to the host. So you're sending a command called verify, which will check the integrity of the data on the device using whatever protection information is present, but it doesn't transfer that uh, data back to the host. And so this can be used uh, during drive diagnostics or data scrubbing to, you know, as, as you're ensuring that the you know, kind of the drive, the data is available for the host to be able to use. Uh, oftentimes it's done in a background checking uh, in a scenario like with a, a storage array. And so the idea here is that instead of having to transfer all of that data from the drive up to the host, that you're able to do that checking on the device itself and significantly reduce the amount of traffic across the bus. And so this is uh, another feature that was added for 1.4. No, the last feature that we wanted to talk about uh, today uh, that was added is around enhanced telemetry capabilities and specifically uh, the persistent event log. Uh, with the persistent event log, what we've added is a mechanism that allows SSD uh, vendors to be able to add uh, information about some uh, you know, kind of you know, cross-platform uh, you know, cross types of uh, errors that are common uh, or, or scenarios, you know, things like firmware commits where the implementation of a firmware update is very specific to a particular vendor information about the status of that, that, that firmware update uh, is nice to be able to be in a consistent format across 
across vendors for the host uh, kind of collection of that data. Uh, so instead of having to have vendor specific information for all of these different kinds of events, uh, you can collect that vendor specific information in a very consistent across vendor type of way. And so this, you know, there, there's many different types of events that are uh, kind of defined here, things about health, uh, like I said, firmware commits, timestamps, power ons and resets, uh, thermal excursions, you know, again, vendor specific things, uh, TCG or security defined events, uh, hardware errors, namespace changes, uh, set feature events, formats, and sanitize operations. And so, again, uh, not only is there consistency in how these uh, events are reported up to the operating system, but also that they persist across resets, they persist across power cycles. Uh, and the value that we see here is that uh, the, the SSD devices are able to define mechanisms that are able to be used for debug across different vendors, uh, excuse me, across different OSs. And that, you know, from the host side, uh, regardless of the SSD vendor that you're working with, you can collect the, the consistent information uh, across devices. And so that's the value that we see uh, inside of this feature. And so, uh, Next, I wanted to talk to you all about some of the uh, required and incompatible changes that are going into the 1.4 specification. So as we move from NVMe uh, 1.3 into NVMe 1.4, uh, there are a number of kind of areas where we went through and provided additional clarity in the specification. And some of those areas uh, required some uh, kind of incompatible changes between uh, revisions of the specification. And so uh, I wanted to kind of talk to some of the some of the changes that went in here. And, and really what we, our goal is, is to kind of point out some of the, the value in those changes so that folks understand both how to get at that list, like we talked about earlier with the changes that were on the website, but also what are the impacts of not making those changes. Some of these things are bug uh, fixes and or uh, kind of, um, yeah, it, it's around basically clarifying behavior so that there's consistency in the ecosystem. So we have things here like uh, new NSID namespace identifier uh, value usages, uh, there's error and reporting requirements, clarifications around temperature thresholds, uh, some enhancements around the controller memory buffer and persistent memory region. There's uh, new requirements around sanitize, uh, reservation notifications, and, and the logs associated with that. Uh, we specified some of the LBA range feature behavior. Again, there's uh, some clarifications there just for consistency. Um, reservation reports and also some new abort command behavior. Uh, this isn't a, an exhaustive list, but these are general areas where changes went in. Uh, on that uh, website kind of change list, that actually has an exhaustive list and we encourage you again to uh, go and look there. But I wanna dive into two of these specific areas. Uh, one is the mandatory changes that are associated with the controller memory buffer. Uh, one of the big changes that went on here is we added a flag inside of the device representing support for the controller memory buffer, as well as an enable bit. Uh, previously, it was undefined uh, effectively whether or not the, the controller memory buffer was enabled by default. And so it generally was, but uh, what happened there is that some operating systems or some hosts were unaware or didn't have support for the controller memory buffer, and that led to some uh, potential for, for security holes. And so we wanted to clean that up. And so one of the things that we did there is basically require that the enable of the controller memory buffer is off or disabled by default. And effectively, the host then has to check for support for the controller memory buffer and enable it in order to make use of it. And what this does is it really uh, cleans up some of those uh, potential security issues that could be there for a specific implementation. 
Uh, in addition to that, we removed some restrictions around the usage of the controller memory buffer. Uh, previously, the submission queue entries, completion queue entries, and data all had to be inside of the CMB or they had to all be inside of the host. And with the, the updates to 1.4, uh, we now allow for a mechanism to be able to have only the, the, the SQ or CQ entries or only the data uh, and, and not require all of it to be present inside of the CMB. So this is a, a, a more flexible implementation. Um, and again, that will depend on the, the specific device that you use and from which vendor. Uh, however, the mechanism for allowing that type of support is now present. The, the second mandatory change that we wanted to talk about was with regard to the namespace ID or NSID value of all Fs. Uh, typically or historically, uh, the all Fs was an indication that this was a broadcast action that was to be done across all namespaces. Uh, but in some particular uses, that didn't really make sense. Uh, it was kind of unclear for a particular command or a particular uh, set get features uh, command uh, or certain admin commands. Like, what does it mean to do all Fs in this particular case? What should, how should my response be on the device side? Uh, and so what we went through is we went through the entire specification, all the I.O. commands, all the get set features, the admin commands, and the reservation usages, and made sure that there were explicit definitions for uh, an NSID of all Fs. Um, there were certain use cases, like uh, David is going to talk about a little bit later, uh, where this makes a big difference, and we, we want to make sure that those things are, are clarified. Uh, but the reason to make these changes is so that when a host actually goes and intends to use that, that NSID of all Fs, that there's consistent behavior across all vendor devices. And so that was, uh, you know, one of the other places where we made some changes that were backwards incompatible uh, and wanted to make folks aware. And so with that, uh, we'll move on to the section on compliance. And David, I'll turn over the presentation to you. All right, thank you very much, Nick, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone out there. I'm David Wolf from University of New Hampshire Interoperability Lab, or UNH IOL. Uh, we work very closely at UNH with the NVM Express organization on supporting the compliance program. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how these uh, updates in the 1.4 specification, uh, how those affect compliance. I'm going to start with a couple slides that are just an overview of the compliance program. And then I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into exactly some of these test cases that have been created around some of those new features that, that Nick just shared with us. So first, uh, as far as an overview of the compliance program, um, we've been doing this compliance program for several years now in cooperation with uh, NVM Express organization. And we've got coverage for each of the specifications uh, that have been produced, both the base specification the management interface or MI specification, as well as the fabric specification. Obviously, today we're going to focus on the base specification and the updates there for the 1.4 spec. Uh, as far as timeline with respect to the compliance program, uh, we usually, our test specifications are going to lag the specification, the base specification itself, by one or two quarters usually. And, uh, so uh, we think about uh, this past year, uh, the 1.4 spec was released in June. Um, it was a little bit later this in the summer that we actually updated some of the test specifications uh, to account for that. It's twice a year that we do those updates to the spe test specification. And kind of our general goal when we do that is address any new technical proposals or ECNs that have been made against the specification to make sure that we kind of, uh, although we're a little bit behind the specification, we want to make sure that we, we keep pace with it. If you look at our test specifications, uh, you're going to see that there's some tests that are identified as mandatory, some tests that are identified as FYI. So obviously mandatory tests are required. FYI, those are informational tests. Anytime we introduce a new test for a new feature, we flag it as FYI. So it kind of puts people on notice that this may become a requirement in the future, but because it's a new test for a new feature, we're going to consider it FYI. And so actually all of the test cases that I'm going to talk about today, uh, they're FYI currently. 
They may become mandatory in the future, but today they're, they're FYI. And again, that's because they're new test cases uh, for new features. Obviously, the NVIDIA specification has a lot of optional features in it. And so when it comes to compliance, uh, the way we treat optional features is you don't have to do it. You don't have to implement this feature. But if you do, you have to do it right. And so uh, for a lot of these tests with optional features, we'll do a check in the beginning of the test to determine if the feature is supported or not. And then the test will proceed accordingly. And so you'll see that in some of my examples that we do that little check first. If a feature isn't supported, if it's an optional feature, the test just skips. Uh, it doesn't have any impact on, on compliance. Uh, and finally, uh, we support the program through some test tools. Um, we provide those test tools and make sure we keep them uh, up to date along with the test specification uh, and make sure we make those test tools available to the community so that people can run them in-house and kind of do a continuous ongoing check uh, with respect to compliance. That's one of the ways that we uh, support the organization. Uh, so some of the deliverables from the compliance program, of course, there's the test specs, which I just discussed, and the test tools. Again, those are available for folks to run in-house. Uh, we do plug fest as well as private testing. We do about two plug fests a year, usually one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, and of course, if folks aren't able to attend the plug fest or they have some reason that they would rather do a private test with us, uh, we make it easy to schedule that as well. All of that goes into qualifying products for the NVMe integrators list. So that's a little bit of an overview of how the compliance program works. Now I'm going to do a deeper dive into four of these new features in the 1.4 specification and some of the tests that we've created around those. Uh, so one is IO determinism, a namespace write protect, the persistent event log, as well as the verify command. Uh, so let's start with IO determinism. Uh, when we're testing IO determinism, uh, of course, this has to deal with a predictable latency. So the first thing we want to do is see if that predictable latency mode is supported. Uh, so we take a look at the identify controller data structure. We'll have our test station send an identify command uh, to the device that we're testing. Look at that identify controller data structure that comes back. If the uh, for attributes field uh, for indicating support for predictable latency mode, if that bit's zero, the feature's not supported uh, and the test moves on. So it has no impact on compliance. On the other hand, if that bit is set to one, that tells us the device is claiming to support predictable latency modes. And so we're going to go ahead and test that. Now, one thing I want to emphasize with respect to testing uh, IO determinism and predictable latency modes, as you saw with the things Nick presented earlier, there's a couple different features in the NVMe spec that have an impact on IO determinism, uh, NVM sets, and also this predict predictable latency mode. What our compliance tests focus on today is that the controller properly advertises support for predictable latency mode and properly advertises its parameters for predictable latency mode. We don't yet have a check on actual latency performance because that's not a compliance issue uh, in and of itself. Uh, so let's look at how this test works. Um, if a device indicates support for predictable latency modes, uh, we're going to do a get log page uh, for the predictable latency per NVM set parameter uh, and allow the device to report back its typical maximum minimum. We're also going to do a get log page for the predictable latency event aggregate uh, log page and allow the device to report that back. We're, again, we're expecting that if a device says it supports predictable latency mode, it's also going to support these associated log pages. Once we do that, we'll do a set feature command to enable the predictable latency mode. So basically to, to put the device in that mode where it's operating with those deterministic and non-deterministic windows. Uh, and then we'll get a get feature command or get feature uh, for the predictable latency mode configuration. And we'll see that the controller actually does indicate that it's turned on that predictable latency mode. So that's kind of a double check to make sure that that uh, set feature command worked. And then we'll do a get feature command to, to get the information about the predictable latency mode window. Again, just making sure that those parameters get reported correctly. 
So for today, that's the uh, compliance that we have for IO determinism. Again, it's really focused on making sure that the parameters get advertised uh, correctly and not so much about actually measuring that latency since that's not a compliance issue. The next uh, feature that we want to talk about is the namespace write protect feature. Now, uh, Nick showed this diagram a little bit earlier. This is taken from the specification. And I've highlighted that first path uh, in this state diagram around whether a product, or whether a namespace, rather, has write protect enabled or not. And you can see that there's different um, parameters with respect to the namespace write protect. Um, a namespace can be write protected. And then that write protect can be on until there's a power cycle, or it can be made permanent. Uh, in these compliance tests that I'm going to share with you today, we're only checking that top path uh, that I've highlighted in green. So we're not doing any checks around power cycling it or whether or not the right protect is permanent or not. We're just looking at enabling and disabling uh, that right protection. So let's see how that test works. Um, first, as with all of our tests, we're going to see if that feature is supported or not. So in this case, we do an identify uh, for the controller data structure. To get that back from the controller. If that uh, namespace write protection capability bit is set to zero, the feature is not supported, and we skip the test. On the other hand, if that bit is set to one, the device says that it supports uh, namespace write protection, uh, we'll do a set feature to make sure we turn off write protection. So we do a, a set feature for that uh, uh, to turn on no write protection, and we expect that it comes back successfully. Now, the reason we do that is because what we want to do is write a pattern to the drive. And so you see in my example here, I write a pattern of, let's say, all A's to that namespace. We expect that to be successful. Then we send that set feature uh, again, but this time with write protection enabled. So we turned off write protection. We wrote a pattern to the namespace. And now we're turning on write protection. So you can see we're, we're toggling that feature off and on. Now, as we saw before, there's a number of commands that uh, can be uh, performed against the namespace and should uh, execute appropriately, even when namespace write protection is turned on. And so uh, we run some of those commands. There's a device self-test command, get log commands, get feature commands, identify commands. All those are admin commands, which we expect to complete successfully, even when a namespace has write protection turned on. There's also NVM commands that should execute successfully. So we do a read command, we do a flush command, verify command, compare command, if those are supported. And again, we expect them to complete successfully even when write protection is enabled. Now, commands that we expect to not be successful are a write command. And so to make sure that that write protection has actually been turned on correctly, we're going to try and perform a write command with a new data pattern to that same namespace, and we expect that the controller is going to come back and say, oh, there's a problem. That namespace is write protected. Then we'll do a read command and make sure that we still see that original data pattern that we wrote. So not only was that write command uh, rejected, but also it didn't have any effect on the data that was actually in that uh, protected namespace. Then we'll toggle the namespace write protection again. We'll turn it off, and we'll try and write a new pattern. So here you see, uh, now we've unlocked that namespace. We write a new pattern, perhaps in this case all Cs. We expect that write command to complete successfully. We do a read command. We see that new pattern come back. We know that namespace write protection is working, and we can see that it's easy to toggle it uh, on and off, and the device is supporting that correctly. Uh, so that's how we check out uh, namespace write protection if it's supported. Another one of the features that uh, we looked at is the persistent event log. Again, we always check and see first. Um, in log page attributes, we're going to check uh, if the device supports the persistent event log. And then we're actually going to go get that persistent event log page. So that's uh, we'll do a get log page 0D. Uh, that's what corresponds to the persistent event log. And the device is going to report back uh, its log. Then we're going to perform some kind of supported event. So the persistent event log itself, there's a number of events uh, that can be logged 
in the persistent event log. Uh, so we're going to perform uh, some of those events. Uh, it could be a set feature command, it could be a sanitized command, it could be a format command. It depends on what the device supports. We're going to perform one of those events and then do that get log page again. And we're going to get back a new persistent event log. And we're going to check and see, did that event that we caused actually get logged in the persistent event log? So we're expecting that the event log that we got previously and the event log that we get after that supported event happens, they shouldn't be identical. They should be different because uh, that log has been uh, updated. Then we're going to do a controller level reset. And this is where we're going to check uh, the persistence of the persistent event log. So we do that controller level reset, allow the device to come back from that reset, look for controller status ready to equal one. That means we've reset it, it's come back, it's ready to do NVMe operations again, and we do that get log page again for 0D for the persistent event log. Now we're getting a third persistent event log back. And we want to check, did what we see in the second persistent event log, it should match or what we see in the third persistent event log, because that log is supposed to be persistent over controller level reset. So that's how we're checking the functionality of the log, that events are being recorded properly, and also that it's persistent. The last feature that we're going to look at is the verify command. Uh, so this was a new command introduced in the 1.4 specification. And there's a couple things we're going to check with respect to the verify command. We're going to check its basic operation, and then we're going to also check that the use of the verify command uh, properly updates the smart health log page. But first, let's just look at the basic operation. Um, we're going to check for support of the verify command. That's indicated in ONCS bit 7 of the identify controller data structure. So if a device indicates that it supports the verify command, we're going to send that verify command uh, with the protection action field set to zero. And we're going to expect uh, the device to come back and say, yes, not only did I advertise support for the verify command in my identify controller data structure, I'm actually allowing a verify command to complete successfully. Then we're going to perform the same thing, but with protection action set to one. So this is actually a condition that's prohibited in the NVMe specification, that that PR act field or protection action field is set to one. So if a device supports the verify command, gets a verify command with that PR act field set to one, it should flag that as an error. And the NVMe specification actually tells us it should be the invalid field in command error. So this is a requirement in the specification. So between these two tests, we've seen that whether or not the verify command works properly, and that if the verify command actually has an error in it, that the device flags that appropriately. Now the next test has to do with whether or not the verify command is properly updating the smart health log. Uh, so let me step through this test. Of course, again, we check to see that the device supports the verify command. Um, and then we do an identify namespace data structure command to CNS0. This is for the namespace data structure. And the reason we do this is we want to get that namespace data structure back to get the LBA data size field. Now, uh, in this example I'm going to show, let's assume that the device reports an LBA data size of 512 bytes. So we've gotten two pieces of information from the device. We've gotten uh, whether or not it supports Verify, and we've gotten its LBA data size. So we're going to use that. Um, uh, to make sure the verify command is working properly. So we do a get log page for the smart health log info log. When that comes back. We're going to look at the data units read value. And this is something that a host might use just to understand kind of how long that drive has been out for, uh, how much data has been read from it, quite literally. Then we're going to do a verify command of the size of LBA data size, and we're going to do it a thousand times. The reason we do that is that smart health info log should be incremented. The data units read value in that log should be incremented for every thousand verify commands of size uh, LBA data size. So we do a thousand of those commands. We check the log again, and it comes back, 
and we're checking is the data unit's red value equal to the value we read before plus one because that verify command um, should increment that data unit's red value in the same way as that value would increment for a read command. So we did it for 1,000. Uh, now we're going to do it again, 1,000 more verify commands, but with a larger size. We'll do it with a verify command of size two times LBADF. And we want to make sure that, again, that data unit's red value increases by two. Then we do it again, this time for a verify command of size 4x LBA data size. Again, we do that 1,000 times, check the log page again, and make sure that it incremented by four. So, so really the requirement here is that the verify command is incrementing that data unit's red value in the same way that a read command would. And so that's how we check that. So just a quick wrap up on the compliance. Um, we've already got support for some of these 1.4 features uh, available in the test tools. Really encourage people to, to download those and run them to check compliance. Uh, and of course, uh, provide feedback for us uh, on those new features. Uh, so that's a you know, summary of what we're doing for our compliance, and uh, we can hand it back now for Q&A. Thank you, Nick and David. Um, now we're going to move on to the Q&A portion. Um, can you give us an example of how MPWG and MPWA help improve I.O. performance? And can you also clarify how these hints differ from DSM? Sure, uh, I can definitely take that one on. So let's let's start with the second question first. You know, can you clarify how the the hints that are inside of the I/O performance and endurance hints differ from uh, data set management? So uh, with data set management, this is really a hint that's coming from the host to the drive, so that the drive is able to prioritize and kind of configure how its background tasks work. So things like uh, how often is the host planning to write to this particular LBA? Uh, things along the lines of, uh, is, is the latency of this particular uh, LBA uh, critical or not? Whereas the IO performance and endurance hint are much more about drive access and kind of the media access on the drive and hints about that up to the operating system. In other words, if you do accesses on a particular alignment, so think of it like it has to be on a, on a, you know, as an example, like an 8K boundary or something like that, or, or a much smaller, but it, just on a specific boundary. And the size of those transactions must be at least a specific size. So again, you're talking about hints that go from the drive up to the operating system or up to the host so that the host is able to uh, kind of uh, make the most efficient and optimized accesses to the device. So basically it's going the opposite direction as far as the hints with DSM. Now, with regard to an example about how do you make use of the uh, NPWG and the NPWA, so this would be the uh, right uh, granularity and the namespace right uh, uh, alignment, uh, how do you use that to improve I.O. performance? Uh, the backend media on the SSD devices uh, already has uh, these, these right granularities and the right alignment requirements, uh, regardless of how the information is kind of interfacing with the host. And so what happens when you're not on these uh, specific uh, granularities or alignments and sizes is that the underlying device is actually doing things like a read modify write. And so you're doing multiple reads, multiple writes to be able to actually do that transaction. And, and so how the IO performance hints actually uh, improve things is by making it so that the kind of the, the back-end firmware that's inside of the SSD doesn't have to do those extra transactions. And, and as a result, uh, the performance of the overall system will go up if the host, uh, you know, kind of makes use of those hints from the device. And so hopefully that's able to answer those two questions. Thanks, Nick. Next question, is there a timeline for full 1.4 compliance testing? 
Sure, I can take that one. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there certainly are some 1.4 uh, features that we're testing right now and that are available in the test tools uh, and that we're going to run at our, at our plug fest that's happening uh, next month. Uh, but we don't have full 1.4 feature support yet. So our goal for implementing all of that is uh, spring of 2020. Um, after this plug fest, we'll get get to work on implementing kind of the the balance, what's remain what's remaining of uh, NVMe 1.4 features that we don't address yet. So uh, early next year, we should be getting that into our test tools and into the test specifications. Great, thanks, David. Um, next question, can you go um, a little more in depth about debugging at scale? Yeah, so what, what I can talk to with regard to debugging at scale is that uh, from, a, from an NVMe perspective, we're really looking at adding the infrastructure that is kind of necessary uh, to do debug. Uh, that's kind of the key focus. So we're trying to build uh, mechanisms that are able to work across vendors and across operating systems in a very consistent type of way. Right now, what happens, uh, a lot of the feedback that is coming into NVMe is that each individual uh, consumer, uh, customer, large-scale deployment of uh, SSD devices has to collect data in a very uh, vendor specific way. And so a lot of our focus is on how do we ensure that there are uh, mechanisms both when it comes to uh, notifications, logging, data that is able to be collected that can be done in a vendor neutral way. Uh, a lot of focus is on the area of what types of events need to be uh, logged, uh, what does the persistence of that logging need to be? Is it, is it kind of able to just be while the device is up and go away at a power cycle, or does it need to persist across power cycles? Uh, if there are specific types of debugging that people feel can be vendor neutral, you know, we're always open to feedback on areas where we are lacking. Again, we're not going to focus on, as an organization, on specifics for a particular device, but areas that can be done in, in a vendor neutral way, types of data that needs to be collected, and kind of the uh, attributes of that data, uh, those are things that we definitely want feedback, and, and if we don't have kind of that, that right set of, of infrastructure there, we would be happy to get feedback to add to those things. Uh, so that's kind of the focus of, of the organization on debugging at scale. Thank you. Next question. For namespace write, protect, and persistent event log, is there a way to test their persistence across power cycles? Yeah, I can speak to this one. Um, I was kind of expecting we might get a question about that uh, since we called out that we're checking persistence across controller level reset uh, for both of those features, but obviously the feature is intended to work across the power cycle. So um, certainly there are ways to test it across power cycle. Um, and, you know, we have ways of doing that in our lab. And certainly people can do that in-house. But we haven't included that um, as part of the compliance the required compliance tests today, um, simply because implement what we're trying to do with the compliance program, what we're trying to do with the tools is uh, provide a mechanism for checking compliance that can be easily deployed in anyone's lab, um, can be used with kind of off-the-shelf hardware. Uh, today, most of the tests are able to be executed with just a regular PC system. And where possible, avoid using any kind of like specialized hardware. Um, and what we found for, for, the, for those features in particular to test them across power cycles, uh, certainly there's equipment that can allow you to do that. Um, but for now, we kind of held back on, on requiring using that equipment for those tests. Certainly, it's a very interesting thing to look at. Certainly, it's a very valuable thing to look at. Um, but we've chosen not to include that in the compliance program today. Um, again, those are things that can be tested um, if you have the right equipment, but um, we haven't put that in the compliance program yet. If we find a simpler way to do it, um, 
I think we'll probably will end up including those in the future if we can find a simple way to do it that doesn't require any specialized hardware. Great. Next question. What changes were made in endurance groups? Yeah, so I, I can speak to that. Um, actually, endurance groups are new to NVMe 1.4. Uh, the, the technical proposal for endurance groups was released uh, quite a while ago. But uh, when you look at it from a 1.3 to 1.4 transition, uh, endurance groups are, are actually a new feature. Uh, just as a kind of a, a reminder on what endurance groups are, that's effectively, um, they're a set of NVMe sets or, or just kind of like a, uh, you know, a group of NVM sets are put within a particular endurance group. And that endurance group effectively says across these uh, this area on the device, we are going to manage the endurance uh, kind of evenly. And so it's basically a communication about how the drive in its kind of back uh, back end features manages endurance across the media for a particular group of NVM sets uh, and the namespaces that sit inside of those sets. Uh, but you know, to the to the main question, what changes were made to endurance groups? Uh, there there weren't additional changes on top of the uh, kind of a, original technical proposal as far as you know defining what endurance groups were. Great, thanks for answering that. Um, next question: Someone would like to know if the mentioned test tools are free of charge for everyone. Or do you have to be a fee-paying member of the NVM Express community? Yeah, I can I can address that one. Um, no, they're they're not publicly or freely available. Um, they're available to folks that are uh, participating in the NVMe community, paying their fees for that, and and taking advantage of the the compliance test service. Great, thanks for answering that. Um, one other question, why not test for compliance to expected latencies in the deterministic and non-deterministic windows in PLM? Sure, sure. Yeah, so basically the reason that we don't check those latencies is that there's not a requirement in the specification about what those latencies are or meeting them. So the drive can advertise the, the, to the host the best way to use the drive. Uh, but it's not a compliance issue around that latency. Now, one thing we're looking at uh, is adding some features to the tools to at least provide the user some information about what the latency was, and then the user can tell if that, you know, is matching up with the advertised latency or not. But again, hitting those latency numbers isn't necessarily a compliance issue. However, it could be a qualification issue uh, for an end user, right? They want to make sure that um, a drive is actually hitting the latency numbers that, that it requires. So that's why we're, we're looking at maybe adding that info into the test tool, but it's not going to actually be a compliance test in its own right, since it's not a spec requirement. Good question. Awesome. Thank you, Nick and David, for answering those questions. It's looking like we're running out of time here, so we're going to conclude the Q&A section. Um, this webinar will be recorded and available for playback on the NVM Express um, Bright Talk channel. And as well, everyone can download the NVMe 1.4 specification on the NVM Express website, nvmexpress.org. Um, thank you all for joining us today. This is the conclusion of the webcast.